everyone. Uh, thanks for joining me. I wanted to start out by just doing a real quick little announcement. Uh, I'm just going to ask you, you don't have to do it, there's no pressure, but if you would like to share uh, this uh, video with your friends and family, I know a lot of them probably wouldn't be on my Facebook page, but they can find me on YouTube. I said that a couple, I don't know, maybe a month ago, that I'd went on YouTube, might have been longer, but uh, my site is called Working Through the Word, W-E-R-K-I-N-G, through is totally spelled out, T-H-R-O-U-G-H, uh, the word. Uh, it's under actually under my profile picture on Facebook, if, um, if you forget what it is. And there's no pressure, like I said. Anyway, uh, let's go to the word of prayer, and then I'll get started. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, that I can come before your throne and that we have that right, Lord, that personal right, and Lord, that uh, we have your full attention when we come to you. And I thank you for that, Lord, that you don't ignore us, that you, you're always ready to listen. And I ask, uh, Lord, that you would just be with me and hide me, the speaker, and Holy Spirit, just show up and, and just touch people's lives, Lord, and their hearts. And I'll give you all the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so my lesson today, the title is called Raptured. And uh, we're going to be in 2 Kings uh, chapter 2, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 15. Uh, we have main characters here um, before I get started. The, the story has three sort of, well, the one group I blobbed together. But anyway, there's three. There's Elijah, who was a prophet. That's spelled with the J. And then Elisha, who was a protege of Elijah, Elijah's. Uh, I looked up the word protege, and the definition is a person who is guided and supported by an older, more experienced or influential person. Then the last characters of the story are called the sons of prophets, or the commentary referred to them as company of prophets. They were like a school or a gathering of disciples around as a rec uh, around a recognized prophet such as Elijah and Elisha. So they would be located actually throughout the country to help with the tide of the spiritual and moral decline uh, in the nation at that time, and that would have been King Jeroboam's reign. Um, I want to dif differentiate. Oh, I said that right this time. Uh, between two name, the two names, you've got Elijah, Elijah with the J, and then you got Elisha. So I just, I'll try to emphasize the J when I talk about it. But anyway, at the time of this story, Elisha, the protege, had been with Elijah for about ten years already. All right. So verse uh, chapter two, I want to do. Um, let's see, uh, verses one and two. And it came to pass when the Lord was about to take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Then Elijah said to Elijah, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Bethel. And Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. So in this verse we see that um, we see that Elijah, the protege, knows that uh, Elijah was going to be going away. He was going to go to heaven. Uh, he was going to be taken. Uh, he probably didn't know how, but he knew it was going to happen. He gets kind of clingy here. He's, you know, this is his leader, and he doesn't want to get him out of his sight, okay? Probably curious, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, as well. So verse 3, it says, And the sons of the prophets were her, who were at Bethel came out to Elijah and said to him, do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And he said, yes, I know. Keep silent. So here we have, um, the Bible doesn't say how this company of prophets knew about this, but they did somehow. Uh, maybe God revealed it to them, to them, or they overheard maybe Elijah and Elijah talking about it. I don't know. My take on this company of, of prophets, when they said this to Elijah, it's like, I don't know if they were trying to one-up him, or taunting him, or... I don't know, maybe they just didn't want him to leave as well. Cause, or were they messing with Elisha? Or were they jealous, you know? Um, but anyway, Elijah instructs Elijah to stay, but he wasn't going to have it. Part of Elijah's character, um, the protege, we see in this storyline that he's very loyal. I feel like he really wanted to learn and to continue to learn from Elijah. He didn't want him to go. He was he was like a sponge just trying to soak it all in what he was learning and he knew it was going to be important what he he learned. God was, you know, teaching him through this man. But 
You can't be with someone 10 years and, and when you're learning the ropes and not become very loyal. And maybe, it, and I'm sure a great friendship as well has taken place. Uh, verse 4, it says, Then Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Jericho. And he said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. So in this verse, stay put, Elijah, is what he's telling him. I'm off to Jericho. I'll say one thing. <laughs> Elijah's persistent in this. He's very persistent. Let me get that up there. He's very persistent. It's a good quality to have. A good quality to have. This is a quality that makes for a good leader. Uh, they'll get the job done. You don't have to worry about that. It doesn't matter how much time, money, steady investment. Whatever it takes, they're going to make it happen. Verses 5 and 6. And the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho came to Elijah and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? So he answered, Yes, I know. Keep silent. So in this, here we go again. <laughs> Once more. <laughs> All right, let me find where my place is. I lost my place, guys. Sorry. There's a lot of words up there. <laughs> okay, again already. What are they doing? Uh, they're doing the same thing. They just had said to him, I think they're becoming a pain in the neck for him. That's what I'm thinking. All right. But, or they're just probably not wanting him to leave as well. But they wanted to still maybe observe and learn. All right. Elijah once more says, hold your peace. Remain silent. Once more, God sends Elijah, what? To another city, Jordan. Again, Elisha is by his side. You know, there's a verse in Proverbs 20, uh, 20, uh, verse 24b and it says that there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother and you know what I think this describes Elisha uh, his sidekick Elijah's sidekick don't you because it, he is he doesn't want to leave his side to go when he's going to these cities uh, one thing I picked up from Elijah is that he's very obedient he when God tells him to do something he does it God had asked him to go to Bethel Jericho and Jordan and he went immediately he didn't beat around the bush and make excuses. Well, I just don't have time, you know. And Elisha three times told him that he didn't want to leave him and he was going to go with him. Was this, was this maybe some kind of test for Elisha? Maybe if it would be if he was going to take over for Elijah? You know, we don't always do this. We don't always connect the dots, all right, when God is talking to us. Sometimes it takes a, when he wants to do something through us and in us. We sometimes don't get it, all right? There's a quote that I saw years ago, and it's I really like it. It says, we live life forward, but we understand it backwards. Let me read it again. We live life forward, but we understand it backwards. And I think I found that in my own life. You can see how God has worked, you know, to get you to this point in ministry and, and that. You just see the different things he's done, which is really cool when you but it didn't I didn't connect the dots forever. It took me a while. But anyway, let me if I ask you a thought provoking question right now, looking back in hindsight, has God been grooming you for something or wanting you to do something? Something anything come to mind when I say that? You know, God has uh, callings to our careers even, including stay-at-home moms. That's very important. Uh, there's all kinds of work out there, but that's your life work, and it's very important to the Lord. We should all do our best at those assignments that he's given us. We need to give it our, our all, just like Elijah had done. They are your purpose, and everyone needs a purpose in life. Okay, got a little sidetracked, all right? I don't know if that was too preachy, but anyway, I just wanted to stir up your thinking, guys, okay? Back to the story. Read verse, I'm going to read verse 7. Um, and the 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood facing them at a distance. Um, I think I might have left out 6. Let me go up to 6. Then Elijah said to him, stay, oh, nope, sorry. Verse 7. I do that a lot, sorry. And 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood facing them at a distance while the two of them stood by the Jordan. So in this verse, the sons of the prophets, they're anticipating. They want to get a firsthand look. I wonder if they brought their binoculars their binoculars, and their lawn chairs, you know. They wanted to get an eye's view of this, you know. I'm sure they were as curious too. You know, they, they're thinking, ooh, this is going to be something to see. All right. And maybe is it even going to happen? They could be thinking. All right. Verse eight. It says, now Elijah took his mantle. He rolled it up and struck the water and it was divided this way and that. 
so that the two of them crossed over on dry ground. So in this verse 8, Elijah's cloak was not only for warmth, but it was also a, simple, a symbol that re represented authority as a prophet. It was also called a mantle. Mantles usually refer to spiritual authority and anointing. Um, one last miracle we get to see right here in this verse. He parts the Jordan River. It's not quite the scale of the Red Sea parting, but it's still amazing, a sight to behold. Verse 9. And so it was when they crossed over that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask, what may I do for you before I am taken away from you? And Elijah said, Please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. So in this verse, we see that Elijah, uh, Elijah asked this question to his protege. And Elijah is not afraid to say, Hey, point blank, give me a double portion of what you've got. A double portion of what? Hmm. His spiritual and prophetic ministry. To put it another way, he was asking to be the heir or his heir or his successor. And they talk about it back in Deuteronomy in the Old Testament in verse, uh, chapter 21, verse 17. It talks about a double portion. But he had asked for a double portion. Think about it, though. Elijah the protege had, I hope I say that's right, saw that he seen him do, he had seen him do many remarkable things over that 10 years. I don't blame him for asking, you know. Verse 10. So he said, you have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. So in this 10, I think the reason that Elijah had said to him that it was a hard thing, it was because he knew it wasn't his mantle, get, mantle to give. It was God's mantle. And it was his choice of who he was going, who was going to take the place of Elijah. All right, verse 11, it says, Then it happened as they continued on and talked that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. So in this verse, they had their last conversation, very bittersweet for both of them. I'm sure they must have uh, seemed like they could, they sensed the timing that was, uh, it was time, and you know, it was Elijah's time. It was his time. Time was up. And we can relate to losing someone near and dear to us. Parting words uh, will be forever etched and rehearsed in our minds. And I'm sure it was for, it will be for Elijah as well. I just can't imagine what that would look like. You know, a chariot of fire coming and horses on fire. And they were blazing tracks. Quick like. You can bet it was quick, quick, quick. Can you imagine both of them standing there and seeing that all play out? You know, how cool and frightening at the same time it must have been. Uh, and it happened, it had to have happened in a split second. But what power that God has, you guys. When I think about that verse, I think he is so powerful. And look, this miracle, this is something, wow. And let's see in verse 12, if Elisha gets <clears throat> what he was asking for. Now Elisha saw it and he cried out, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. So he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and tore them into pieces. And that tearing his clothes was just, you know, upset, crying, or whatever, emotions that he had. That he was losing his, you know, his leader. Uh, Elijah saw it, though. Yay! And you know what? We, we all probably have heard that famous line, you know, parting is such sweet sorrow from that one movie, you know, a long time ago. Uh, he may have even felt that this, that, Elijah was a father figure to him. Uh, he was definitely his spiritual father, there's no doubt. For he had been the strength of Israel. And you know, that must have probably hurt him like what? Like a sore thumb. You know, you've, you and I have had things that just hurt like a sore thumb. They just, it hurts. And this had to have hurt him. But there was one good thing that did come out of it, you know. He did see. And uh, however, this whole thing unfolding, which meant, all right, that he was going to what? And let's see what it says. He also, in verse 13, he also took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. So in this verse 13, what he had asked for, he inherited that mantle, which was good. Verse 14, it says, Then he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had struck the water, it was divided this way and that, and Elijah, Elijah crossed over. So in verse 14, we see 
It seems as soon as he gets this new mantle, God enabled Elijah to do the same thing that Elijah had just done. He parted the waters so he could get across the Jordan. And this was just an indication and an assurance to Elijah that God was going to be with him on his new prophetic ministry. How reassuring that had to be for him. Uh, verse 15, it says, Now when the sons of the prophets who were from Jericho saw him and said, The spirit of Elijah rest on Elijah. And they came to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. So we see the sons of the prophets, they got this, this whole picture they saw. They come running up to Elijah, all bowing to him, which God never liked people to bow down. They were only to bow to God. But anyway, uh, they, they, they'd they seen it all. And, di and it did rest on Elijah. They would be witnesses and they would be a voice to prove to others that yes, the mantle now lies on him, lies on to him. We have seen him perform the same miracle as Elijah. You better listen to him. Just a note here in passing, Enoch and Elijah were the only two in the entire Bible that actually were mentioned that they went to heaven without dying. Also, the only other person taken to heaven in bodily form was our sweet Lord Jesus when he was resurrected from the dead. Well, when he went back up uh, to heaven. In closing, I want to read from 1 Thessalonians in chapter 4. I think it's very fitting here. And I want you to listen real closely, okay? I'm going to start with verse 13. And I'm in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It's in the uh, New Testament. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. That's eternity, guys. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Pretty cool there, you guys. Um, I have, I want to show you this one. This will really kind of give you, give me a second here to get around the table. This was actually my son's Star Trek toy that he had when he was much, much younger. But guess what? Mom gets it now. All right. So Dale and I practiced on this. This is the Star, Star Trek transporter. And that is a picture of me. I don't know if you can see it. Well, that's me on the wooden thing there. But anyway, I want you to see how quickly. All right. That's how the rapture is going to happen, guys. Let me do that one time for you. One more time. Oops, my noise. My sound effect messed up. Okay, so in seconds, all right, in seconds, we'll be raptured out. You know what? I know you can't see me, but I'm coming around. <laughs> anyway, and yes, it'll be that quick. In fact, Dale loved this so much that I put him in there, and I haven't seen him ever since. <laughs> Just tease. I knew you know that. But in all seriousness now, you guys, for those of us who know Jesus Christ as their own personal Savior that have asked him into the heart, uh, we will be disappearing in the rapture, and it'll go that quick. Uh, just as quickly as Elijah was swept away, we will be swept up to heaven as well to be with our Lord and Savior for eternity. And you guys, eternity is a long time. It's forever. It's hard to believe that, but that's the way it is. I hope, you guys, I plead with you not to put it, this decision, on the back burner. Okay? Later... Uh, Later will be too late, my friend, okay? One of the biggest lies that Satan has that he wants to tell us is, you've got time. Do I get that right? You've got time. Don't listen to that. Let me ask you this. I think it's fair to say that most of you guys uh, have insurance for your car and for your house, right? And why is that? Just in case. Because it's too late, God forbid, if you don't have it up front ahead of time and something happens, you're out of luck, but w you have it because of peace of mind, all right? Why fight this anymore? Why do you fight, and what do you think you're giving up? There's nothing better than knowing the Lord is your Savior. Is your life going to be perfect? No, I've said that before, but you guys need to get your God insurance policy. You need to get it settled, all right? And you can settle it because of what Jesus did at the cross, and you will settle your eternity here on earth. 
Ask him to come into your life. Uh, ask him to forgive your sins. Receive him as your personal savior. And believe he's, he died and he's coming. Well, you know he, you believe he died. And that he's coming back one day. That we can live with him. Anyway, make him your Lord and your Savior. I want to close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this word. Father, I just pray you would touch many, many souls out there. Uh, I pray they will make this decision. And I will give you all the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, guys.